Hello, everybody. We're going to get started. As you can see, I am outside. So forgive some of my squinty eyes and my bad coloring, but I really just wanted to have a chance to show you my girls here in the background because we're talking chickens today with Lisa Steele of Fresh Eggs Daily. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Katie. It looks so beautiful there. It's still all, winter in Maine, but it looks so yes, nice there. Yes, we should mention Lisa is in Maine. So if you follow her on Instagram or Facebook or all of the places you can find her, you'll see lots of amazing snow-covered pictures. Um, <laughs> do you still have snow on the ground? We do. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What zone are you? We're 5A, 5B, depending on you know, elevation and where exactly yeah. you're standing in the county. Um, yeah. We don't usually plant till Memorial Day, but on the flip side, we have super long days in the summer. So mm -hmm. our hours of daylight um, are really long. So when stuff starts growing, it starts growing fast. We have about 100 frost free days. So we're limited. Yeah, well, but you have a lot of other wonderful things too, you maniacs. Um, right. And us here in the mid-Atlantic, we are having some gorgeous days. So I hope you guys made it down to the garden center yesterday at Homestead, or you are able to enjoy the outdoors today. Cannot believe I'm out here in this like lightweight shirt. But so anyway, I did want to mention my chickens are back there. So if you do hear some things in the background, like egg laying noises, that is what it is. <laughs> um, but we're going to cover with Lisa talking about chicks and bringing chicks home because at Homestead, chicks are coming. I know our, our title said the chicks are here, but chicks are coming. They're not quite yet in the garden center. Lisa, are, chicks in high, are chickens in high demand, like more demand than ever? Yeah. Last year, some of the hatcheries said that their um, sales were up 500%. Of course, chick days sort of happened right when COVID hit. So there was a lot of panic buying is what they're calling it. Um, but I don't know that a lot of people who got them last spring aren't totally hooked now and are maybe expanding their flocks or anyone who didn't jump in last year, I think is jumping in this year because I mean, I don't know about you, but things are not ending like tomorrow, you know? So we're still kind of not sure what's going on. And I feel like People are like, well, this could go on forever, so I might as well just get my chickens now, you know? So yeah. I haven't heard exact numbers for this year, but I would guess that, yes, because I know some of the breeds I was looking online. I do go to my feed store. I order some online because I want different breeds, and a lot of the breeds are already selling out. So mm -hmm. if you're going to get chicks, either check with your feed store to find out when they're getting them so you can be first in line or get your order in now. Yeah, it's just like plants, you know, people are home, they want the joy of backyard chickens. It's not just the eggs. When I first got chickens, I got them as a Mother's Day present six years ago. And I've always wanted like this little backyard farmette, but I never knew how much of a companion animal they would become. To me, it's not just about the eggs. You know, it's like growing flowers. You get the benefit of planting, you get the benefit of enjoying and maybe cut flowers. Chickens are truly this this companion animal. Um, so that's what we're going to really dive in today with, with Lisa is learning about when chicks are right for you, if it's right for you, and all of the little secrets and tips. In fact, I have some pictures. Lisa wrote a book. How long ago was your chicks? I know, sorry, my screen. How long ago was your Letch Hatch, Hatch Chicks book? Uh, 2019, maybe 18, something like that, I believe. So I she have has copied. <laughs> oh my god well and my virtual chicken i have my little yes. zoom chicken that comes on the zoom calls with me <laughs> oh my goodness and just in case you're wondering what we're talking about these are the babies but we should start out by talking to people a little bit about responsibility as we have easter coming up in two weeks um do you want to have a little sentence or you say about that about responsible chicken ownership and buying on easter yeah it's really it's heartbreaking and i think this year maybe not as much because a lot of people really do have good intentions of starting a flock but every easter people go buy the baby chicks and the ducklings for the easter basket and then especially ducks tend to get dumped at lakes or ponds or parks you know people are like they're ducks they can just migrate whatever domestic ducks can't fly um the ducklings and the chicks need heat you know they're not going to survive so it's it's you know it's it's not a responsible thing to do to do impulse buying um a lot of places you have to buy six which I don't understand that it's supposed to stop the impulse buying, but now you've just got six that are going to get dumped. So I don't really understand that rule, but I mean, think about it. I think that, first of all, check if you can have them. I mean, some, yeah. you know, a lot of urban suburban areas, 
areas are allowing them. So if you really want chickens and you think you might not be able to have them, you might be surprised, but you also might be surprised the other way because every town, every municipality is different. So check your laws, check how many you can have, if you need a permit, if you can have a rooster, I mean, there's all kinds of things. And if you don't like the laws, change them before you jump in. Yes. Don't spend a lot of time and money and energy and, and getting attached to these chickens only for your town to turn around and say, you can't have them because that's on you to learn the laws. And if you want to change them, change them before you get the chickens, because there's a lot of that too. And, and then people are fighting and, and it's just, it's unnecessary. So yeah. find out what your laws are before you get started. Um, I'm not saying that I'm totally against, you know, you having chickens if you're not supposed to, but you should definitely know your laws. <laughs> so you know what you're getting into. I personally think everybody should be allowed to have them, but um, I think you so do that good. and then do a little research into your climate, you know, where Katie is. Uh, we used to live in Virginia. You can pretty much raise whatever you want because it's temperate. Uh, here it's a little colder, so cold hardy breeds are important. And oh, a website like My Pet Chicken, Meyer Hatchery, um, is probably your best bet. They are there's so much information. They have a picture of the breed, a picture of the chick, a picture of the eggs, the temperament, how many eggs they lay. You know, if they're cold hardy, if they're heat tolerant, you can use that almost as like your chicken encyclopedia. Get their catalogs. I love to have the catalog so I can like put post its and you know mark notes on it and all that but do some research into which of the hundred breeds you actually want and if you can get six chickens get six different breeds what do you have katie what, what kind of what breeds so i have australorps i have rhode island reds i have um brahmin gold is that is that they're called gold or yellow i'm not sure um but i always buff, thought buff, you know, Brahma, i think yes yes um i it's funny because it seems like, cause I got two, four and six of each breed. So I have three breeds, six chickens, and it seems like they hang out together, but am I just making that up? No, my chickens do too. They tend to hang out either by like brooder mates, you know, cause I've had a bunch of different years, different chicks or by color, basically breed. And I don't know how they know what color they no. are. But they they seem to hang around together. They like do. chickens definitely form cliques. They are like the original mean girls in your high school. <laughs> and you know, if you're not in the that clique, you are not sitting at that table. You know, yeah. Um, they pal around with their friends, and when you let them out in the yard, you know, they definitely separate into groups. Yeah, um, and funny? they hang out with who they want to hang out with. Yeah. Well, we're getting some comments about um, people who know of people who had to rehome their chickens. And so make sure I'm part of two local chicken Facebook groups. So, you know, and you can go on Lisa's Facebook page and see if you can find a community group. If you don't have one, you know, draw up the interest in your community because there's likely more people who want to change the laws in your area. So let's talk about some other Thank getting you. started things. Like one thing I didn't consider when I first had chickens was where to put my coop in my yard because we get so much cold weather, you know, and hot weather. So you want protection from the heat of the summer, but you also want the snow to melt. At least I want, you know, some of the snow to melt faster in the winter. So do you have advice on putting your placement of your coop? Yeah, in Virginia, uh, we made, it was my first time with chickens as an adult. I had them as kids, but as kids, you don't pay attention to like the ins and outs, you know. No. So I built this little coop and we stuck it in the yard down by the barn full sun in Virginia. And the first summer I had to hire some friends to come and help me move the coop into the shade yes. because it was way too hot. So in Virginia, we had our coop in the shade under trees. We did get a little bit of snow, a little bit of cold, but it wasn't bad. Um, here in Maine, my son, my coop is in full sun all day facing South. Um, in the summer, it does get a little warm there sometimes, but by sundown, it cools down. And this way in the winter, it's usually 20 degrees warmer inside the coop than it is outside um, because the coop is just in the sun and that sunlight streams in the windows, you know, so, so think about that. If you have a chance to have a movable coop, um, that's really good, especially if you live somewhere where you get coldish winters, but warm summers. And that way you could, you know, just like move it around um, where you need it. You can also put up tarps and stuff, you know, sunshades yeah. over your run to give them a little more shade in the summer. But chickens overheat really easily so if, if you're trying to decide put it somewhere where they can stay cool in the summer 
great tip because it is hard to move. We actually moved this coop. There's a there's a coop back there. Um, you can't see it with the run, but we moved it from my old house and these things are heavy. You don't want to be moving them too much. So, well, that's great advice. Um, all right, let's talk about more about um, things you need to get started when you bring chicks home. So Homestead, if you go to your local garden center they'll, or your feed store, Lisa, will they likely have breeds that are per climate specific for that area? Not always. Okay. It's like your garden center. You know, you go into your garden center and they're selling stuff that either A, won't grow in your zone or B, it's too early. You know, so, always you know, new. I wouldn't necessarily count on that, but they should. You know, they yeah. should have breeds that are the ones that people are interested in and, and looking for. Um, that's, it's, it's a good um it's a pretty safe bet, but then they always carry some of those breeds that you'd look at them and you go, that's not going to work very well here. Do your um, research. One of the things that yeah. I looked at too is kid friendly because I want kids. So some of them are maybe more pro just like plants. You know, some of them are made to bloom. Some of them are made for fragrance. Some chickens are egg layers and they'll lay an egg a day consistently, but maybe they won't be so friendly or, you know, they're, they're cold, more cold hardy. What are some other things chickens are bred for? I mean, friendliness, I guess that's really color yeah. of egg. Color of egg, the, the appearance of the chicken, um, cold, hardy heat tolerance, uh, temperament. That's a good point. If you do have kids, um, you're probably going to want to go for breeds that are known to be more friendly, like your Australorps, your Buffs, your Brahmas, um, Silkies, Cochins. Those are some of the really calm kind of lap chickens. Um, they're not crazy like the Leggerns or the Americanas or Wyandots. Um, but I think any chicken, you get it as a baby chick, you know, you teach your kids how to be gentle with it, you let them hold the chicks and interact with them as they're growing up. I think almost any chicken will end up being fairly friendly, but you have a better chance with some of the breeds, like the ones that you mentioned that you have, because yeah. um, they're just bred to be more, they're almost like golden retrievers, you know, as opposed to like a beagle or a chihuahua or something yes. like that, that's a little yeah. bit more flighty. One of our first buff Orpingtons would never leave me alone outside. I mean, and they know, you know, I, I read somewhere that chickens can recognize like a hundred faces, something like that. So they know when you're coming out, they know who's going to feed them. You know, sh this Betty was her name. She would run up and accompany me in the garden everywhere I went. It is, like I said, they are companions. You will find them such a joy to have. Well, what other things before we bring chicks home? So what kinds of things do we need to get in our home, you know, to put them in or watering food? What are some of the checklists of things we need? Yeah, um, actually, I do have a checklist on my blog because people ask me so often, but they need a safe place to live and grow up. So if you're getting, you know, three, four, five chicks, a big plastic tote, like the clearish frosted one, the biggest one you can find at Target or Walmart or wherever you go with the cover. And then I just cut a window out of the cover and put some screen on top, you know, yeah. so they don't fly out. So your cat mm -hmm. doesn't hop in, whatever. Um, but that's probably the easiest um, because it it's not going to get wet like a cardboard box, although you can use a cardboard box. You can use a stock tank. You can use a galvanized tub, you know, just something that's going to keep them contained. You need a heat lamp with a red heat bulb. Your feed store should have those. You clamp that onto your little tote. Um, you need something to put in the bottom of it. Uh, you don't want to use newspaper. It gets super slippery. So I yeah. actually put down newspaper. I put rubber shelf liner over it. Like, you know, that that you yeah. put like in your, yep. I put that because it's nice and grippy and they can you know get a good hold on it. And that's easy to take out and just hose off, throw the newspaper out. Um, you can use shavings. Anybody who has raised chicks in the house knows shavings are so Messy. dusty. Like yes. there will be dust in your house in every crevice for years. So I actually don't use shavings anymore. Um, I just swap out the shelf liner more often and I put clumps of dirt and grass and stuff which surprisingly is much cleaner than the shavings. Um, and they love to like go through the dirt and sometimes they find worms or they find little weeds or whatever. Um, so that's that. Then you need a uh, feeder and waterer. They sell little, you know, like little miniature sized ones at the feed store. And then you need some chick feed. And I mean, that's, that's really it. So I pulled up a great graphic. Let me see if I can see my computer here. It's probably a little too small for you guys to see, but you have a great graphic on what should, it's specific chick food, just like a baby. Any baby animal is going to need something different than um, a hum an adult animal. Chicks need the same thing. And so make sure you're picking up specific food for chicks. And why is that? I mean, obviously they're growing faster, but why do they need a, a different formula? 
Yeah, it's, so the chick feed is higher in protein. They're going to grow more in the first eight weeks than they grow the entire rest of their life. So for the first eight weeks, they're on a chick starter feed, and it should clearly say chick starter. It probably has a chick on it. It's going to be 20% protein or so. Yeah. Um, then after eight weeks, you're going to switch into a grower feed, which is a little bit lower in protein. Their growth is slowing a little bit. You'll keep them on that from eight weeks until about 18 or 20 weeks when they're getting ready to lay. And at that point, you'll switch into a layer feed. The layer feed um, has lower protein, but it has higher calcium. They're going to be laying eggs. They need the calcium to lay eggs. If you feed layer feed to chicks, it can cause problems with their kidneys because it's just too much calcium for their little bodies. They don't need it. Mm -hmm. um, I was gonna I was gonna say something about the layer feed and I forget. Oh, layer feed does not make your chickens start laying eggs. I get so many emails from people saying, I switched my chickens to layer feed two weeks ago and they're not laying. It's it's not gonna make them start laying. It's just that they need that calcium when they do start laying eggs. If you don't get them on it right when they start laying, it's fine because they've been eating calcium in their regular food. They store it in their bones. And when, you know, the first couple eggs, they can just use what they've stored in their bones. But long term, they will actually leach the calcium out of their bones to put into their eggs. And that can obviously cause problems. So the three stages are super important. Some feed companies have gone to just two stages, just a starter grower and the layer. So depending on what brand you choose, you might only have the two stages. I prefer the three. I just think something that's more, you know, specific to that age is mm -hmm. better instead mm -hmm. of kind of an all encompassing. And when, so the tip going back to having them in the home, that is a great tip because we did that. We had a unfinished basement before, so I didn't care about the dust. I didn't even notice it. But then when I moved to this home, I had to bring them in my home. What are the right temperatures? So if people are bringing them home, I know it's all different in all different areas, but um, if you have an unheated or attached garage or an unheated basement and you have that heat lamp, do you think that's an okay place to have your chicks? It can be, they should be kept at 95 degrees the first week, 90 degrees the second, 85, third, 80 degrees. I mean, a chicken's body temperature is right around 100 degrees. So those chicks under a mother hen are pretty warm that first week. And yeah. I think people underestimate how warm, you know, people say, well, they're going to be in my house and we heat our house. Well, your house is not 95 degrees, you know. So if you're going to put them in your basement or your mudroom or something like that, um, or an unfinished garage or something, put the heat lamp on and then watch them. If they're all huddled under the lamp and they're peeping really loudly, they're probably too cold. Yeah. You know, if they're all spread out like against the sides with their wings, oh, you know, if panting, then yeah. they're too hot. Yeah. They, they can be, you know, milling around, you know, not freaked or not stressed. So watching them, I mean, my first batch of chicks, I had a little thermometer and I put it in there and I, you know, I was constantly playing with the heat, trying to get it exactly the right thing. And after like the first batch, you know, I, I just kind of glance in there and be like, yeah, they're fine. <laughs> so, yeah. But it's, well, it's serious stuff. I mean, if chicks get chilled, they they will often die and they can't recover. So it's really important to keep them warm for that first at least six weeks or so. Yeah, those are two great tips about whether they're all huddled. Now, they do tend to sleep together. or mm -hmm. mine, oh, So, you know, all the time if they're huddled, standing under the light. If you see them sleeping. And if they're peeping. Together, yeah. If they're peeping they're really yeah, it was so funny. I was doing a talk once at, at a feed store or a fair or something like that. And I had just mentioned that if a baby chick is cold, they're probably going to start peeping really loudly. And a little girl raised her hand like a couple of minutes later. And I called her and she said, there's a cold baby chick in this store somewhere because one of the chicks was peeping. She heard peeping. And so I was like, can you go over and find out which chick is cold? That's funny. Well, we just got yeah, a first question from Heather and we're talking about the chick starter food. And she said, what's your opinion on medicated versus non-medicated? That's a great question. There are, there are two types of feed. You can get medicated or non-medicated. I tend to do everything. And anyone who follows me knows I tend to do everything as naturally as possible, you know, as close to the way my grandparents did it. Um, it's the way I, we eat. It's the way we live our lives. I don't use medicated feed. The medicated feed isn't technically medicated, though. What it is, it's a vitamin. I believe it's a vitamin B a thiamine blocker. Mm -hmm. So what it does is um, it helps protect the chicks before their immune systems are developed from coccidiosis, which is the number one killer of baby chicks. It's just something that they can contract, they'll get sick and die. Um, 
So this protects them until their immune systems are strong enough to protect them on their own. Um, I don't think there's a wrong or a right answer. I just personally choose not to use it. Part of the reason I bring the clumps of dirt and grass into the brooder is because I'm bringing in some of the outdoor pathogens. So I'm stimulating their immune systems by letting them get accustomed to what they're going to encounter outside. If you raise chicks under a mother hen outside, they are going to be hardier, healthier, grow better, thrive more because they're outside. They're coming in contact with all this stuff, you know? So it's kind of like the boy in the plastic bubble. Like you don't want to clean your brooder every hour. You want things to accumulate. You want things to start growing. You need their immune systems to, to be challenged a little bit. So um, I use the clumps of dirt and grass instead of the medicated cool. feed, but it's not, I mean, if you feel more comfortable, it's your first time and, and you're just not, you know, comfortable taking that chance, you absolutely can use the medicated feed. And if you have, a, if you are raising chicks under a mother hen, if she hatched them, she can actually eat it too, because it's not really chemicals. It's just good tip. And thank you for that question, Heather. You guys, whatever other questions question. you have, now is your chance to ask. In fact, I have a question, not really about chicks, but I accidentally ordered food from Chewy, chicken food from Chewy the other day, and it was crumbles for my adults. Is that okay? Because I usually get layer pellets. Does it matter? No, that's so this, the chick starter is always crumble because yeah. the babies, the grower is also crumble. I believe I, I don't know if you can get grower and pellet then comes layer feed. And at that point you have the choice between crumble or pellet or whole grain, which is another whole thing. Um, I use crumble okay. because I tried pellet and my ducks especially were like, we don't we know don't what like this it. is because we've never seen anything that looks like this in our lives. Um, yeah. So I use crumble. People say there's more waste, but I don't give my chickens more until they eat everything they have. Um, so I never switch to pellet. And on the occasion when my husband has gone and bought feed and he brings home pellet by accident, I try to give it to them. They're not all that excited about it. Um, but it's the same thing. They just take pellets and they run them through like a crusher and they crush them. So it's exactly the same thing. Got it's it. Personal preference. Got doesn't it. matter at all. Well, that wouldn't have happened if I went to Homestead and picked it up, but I live two hours away. So, um, all right. Well, I think unless you guys have any questions, we just got a question from Rebecca. Sorry about my, my, let me look at it. She said, I heard you shouldn't let your rooster eat layer feed because of the calcium. What do you think? Okay. So technically the rooster doesn't need the calcium because he's not laying eggs. So he in effect is going to be getting more calcium than he needs. Um, realistically, unless you're going to keep him separate and feed him grower right. feed, it, it makes no sense. And most chickens, sadly, do not die a natural death at 12 years old. I mean, especially a rooster, you know, if you're free ranging, a fox or a coyote or a dog or something is probably going to get him way before too much calcium starts yeah. to affect him. But that uh, that's a good question, because you also need to put out a calcium supplement for your chickens. Even on the layer feed, um, some hens, especially your really good layers, might need more calcium than, than the feed. So you should give them crushed oyster or eggshells. You always should put those separate in a separate container. Like I use a little, um, it's almost like a bunny feed dispenser on the wall mm -hmm. of my coop. Um, you want to always put the oyster shell or the eggshell separate. Your rooster won't touch it. And if you have any younger non-laying hens or older hens that aren't laying anymore, they won't touch it. So only the right. layers that know they need it. <clears throat> so I wouldn't worry about a rooster eating because um, we've had roosters. We actually have a male duck who's 12 years old and he's lived with the chickens his whole life. He's been eating layer feed his whole entire life and he's fine. Um, Great tip. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask more about, oh, so you don't need to give that oyster shell or the eggshell to your chickens until they, until they start laying, right? Correct. What about the grit? So again, the clumps of dirt and grass, <laughs> there's also little stones in there. Um, so the baby chicks will eat some of them because chickens don't have teeth, obviously. So they need something to digest their food. And what that something is, is little stones and pebbles and rocks and things. So you can buy grit at the feed store, um, but it's basically just rough, coarse dirt stones. So if you let your chickens to free range out at all, they're gonna grab it. We have a dirt driveway. And when I let my chickens out, they make a beeline for the driveway. They eat all the rocks they need. Um, and for the baby chicks, like I said, the clumps of dirt and grass, there's always little stones in there that they will eat. So if you're giving them anything other than their feed, that's going to help them digest it. So I don't, 
I mean, if you want to spend your money on grit, that's fine. But <laughs> there's it's not really necessary. If you have a dust bath, we have a dust bath in our run also, like for the winter, especially. And there's dirt in there and the chickens will go through that and pick out the rocks they need. So how do you keep the dust bath or do you not worry about keeping it clear of snow? Or is it covered? Oh, it's under. Yeah. So part right. The part of our run that attaches to the coop is covered. Um, so in there is their dust bath and where I keep their food and water because they don't put food or water inside the coop because it just makes a mess. It gets everything wet. It attracts flies and mice and all that. So they come outside to eat. Yes. Same. Uh, all right. So let's, we've covered a lot on chicks. We'll come back to any questions that you guys have. Um, one of the things that as a new chick owner, you might not understand that the idea of introducing chicks into adult chickens, but if perhaps you got chickens for the first time last year, and now you're going to get some more, we talked a little bit in the beginning of this about mean girls and about, um, the chicken pecking order, if you will, that obviously comes from somewhere. So would you give us a few tips? And I know you have a ton of information about this on your website too, but um, first yeah. of all, be aware that there, there likely will be an issue introducing, well, when do we, first of all, when is the appropriate temperature and right time to introduce or bring our chicks outside? And then talk to us a little bit about making that introduction. Yeah. So this is a great topic. I actually got an email from somebody last spring who said um, he got baby chicks from the feed store and he put them in his run with his chickens and they ate them. <laughs> they literally like all that was left was wings when he went back and he was like, do chickens eat other chickens? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he told me that. And I was like, okay, first of all, you should never put baby chicks in with adult <gasps> hens unless they've been hatched under a mother hen and she's going to protect them. And you know, that that's the easy, I love doing that because that you avoid this whole integration thing. She, yeah lays down the rules. The chicks are part of the flock from day one. She the lets hunter. everybody know not to mess with them. Perfect. But most of us don't do that. So yeah, your chicks are in the house six or eight weeks. I like to get them outside on nice sunny days. Um, you know, once it's getting to be like 60 or 65 during the day, get them outside. I use like a puppy playpen or if you have a small starter coop, something like that, try to get them next to your other chickens so they can see them, get used to them for a week or two. Um, I wouldn't actually try to integrate them till they're about 10 or 12 weeks old. So they're, you know, almost the size of your older chickens. Um, never, ever get rid of that starter coop that you started with because it comes in handy for so many reasons. <laughs> you yes, know, you I can put them in that. that. I sold mine on Facebook yard sale. That's all right. <laughs> I know. Yeah. If, oh, if you mistake. have a sick chicken or if you have a mother with babies or if you have the new ones. But anyway, so you put them side by side whether you have to construct like a temporary run or divide your run, whatever, let them get used to each other, let each them look at each other. Um, and then I try to free range them together a little bit. Neutral territory, everybody's excited about looking for bugs, see how they do. Um, you have to let them work it out. The pecking order definitely is a thing, but if it gets bloody or if they're all ganging up on one, you'll have to separate them and try again. But I would say after predators, the whole integration thing is the next hardest thing about raising chickens because man, they do not like newcomers at all. They absolutely, it's a threat to their place on the pecking order. It's someone to eat the treats. It's someone to get the highest roost. Yeah. Um, well, so eventually said, though they do. Yeah. I mean, a couple of years later, I've noticed, you know, chickens from different batches actually are friendly with That's each right. other, but yeah. It takes well, and, a while. Oh, and go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say never. I see this all the time online. Never, ever add the new chickens at night. You know, you see someone say, oh, add them at night in the dark. They'll wake up in the morning and they'll think the other ones were there. As you mentioned, they can recognize over 100 other chickens or people or whatever. And if you don't open that coop up right at sunrise, you've got a bunch of chickens oh, that don't know each other all cooped up together and you could have a bloodbath. So that makes me crazy when I read that because I want to add them when I can watch. I want to stay. I want to make sure there's no problems. If you have one chicken that is being a bully and everyone else seems to be getting along, except she's not take her out, put her in a dog crate for a couple of days, you know, with food and water, but um, <laughs> take her out. <laughs> That'll knock her, you know, down a couple yeah. of pegs maybe on the parking order and then try to add her back. But yeah, the integration thing is such a pain in the neck. 
And it's tough because emotionally you see them getting picked on, but you have to remember that we, we often need to let nature take its course. Now I do a couple things that Lisa noted is if you start to see blood, what I've heard is that they go after blood. And so, you know, if a few feathers on their hind are missing or their neck, that's okay. But really look for that blood. That's when, you know, maybe to separate them. Yeah. Yeah. Or if they're gay enough, you know, and I have like out in my run, I have stumps, I have perches, I have yep. a swing, I have benches, you know, so there's things that they can hop up on, things they can hide under. You got to give them place to like get away from each other. Um, but mostly it's about watching. And, you know, if it's not working if, after a week or two of side by side, they're, they're still not getting along. Give it another week. Yeah. Then and try it again. I'd add too, and to reiterate Lisa's stuff that she's put out there is if they don't have enough water or fresh water, they don't have enough food or treats, they're going to even be more competitive for that. So that's why I love the mm -hmm. idea of letting them free range together because there's no competition. They're not thinking this person, this chicken's after my treat. So continue to give them treats. Can we give our chicks any treats like mealworms or anything, or should we wait until they're in the coop? Yeah, well, the, the first eight weeks, I try to keep them mostly eating their chick feed, but I will give, they'll nibble on the grass. I like to give them dandelion yep. greens. I give them herbs. If we have any herbs coming up, basil or, or parsley or dill, um, mealworms or grubs, scrambled eggs, oats. I try to keep it to that. Like I wouldn't give them like our dinner leftovers, <laughs> like I give yeah. to our big chickens, you know? Um, but I do, you know, if you see a mother hand out with her chicks, she's pointing out seeds and berries and earthworms yeah. and yeah. you know, there's all kinds of things. So we are focusing on chicks, but I would love to know if you have some tips. I mean, you just talked to us a lot about secrets, but to keeping our egg layers, once our chicks get to that egg laying phase, which could take, you know, we got, we have had chickens at all times of the year. Five, four out of six of these, we got them last April, did not start laying until just recently. So it could be a long period of time, or we've had some that we got in the spring and they started laying in September. So, you know, I, I don't know if that's a breed specific thing or, or what that is, but, you know, don't worry if the chicks that you got this year, if you get chicks, you know, just consider that they may lay this fall or as late as next spring, right? It does depend. It depends on when in the spring you got them. In general, your baby chicks will start laying in the fall and they'll lay through that first winter. A lot of people will light their coop in the winter to keep their chickens laying because chickens naturally will slow down as the days get shorter. But again, I like to do what I feel like my grandparents did and farmers would have new baby chicks each spring and the roosters would obviously go into the freezer and the, the new hens would lay that first winter. So all the older hens got a break, the new chickens would lay each winter. So you always have somebody laying and then come spring, your older hens are going to start up again. But yeah, some breeds, I had a chicken once that didn't lay her first egg till she was 38 weeks old. Woo! So she, yeah, it is kind of breed specific. Uh, the, the larger breeds tend to take a little bit longer to start. I think the blue egg layers, like the Americanas and Easter eggers, take longer. It might just be that it seems longer because you're dying for that blue egg. But yeah, it's yeah. very, even within a breed, it's very hen specific. You know, if yeah, you get is. two chicks the same day, same breed, they're probably not going to start laying the same day. Yeah, it's so interesting and such a fun process to watch. So what are some tips on keeping them healthy egg layers? Let's leave predators aside for now. We'll come back to a couple predator <laughs> proofing tips. But, um, you know, the types of treats, you talked about oyster shells and eggshells already. Are you putting actual, you make an omelet and you crack it and then you throw those eggshells in the coop? Yes, and I get I get a lot of flack on social media every time I show a picture of my chickens eating a tray of you know, leftovers, rice or vegetables or whatever, and there's eggshells in there. I don't believe that feeding your chickens eggshells will make them go and seek out eggs to eat. You know, I think that by giving them the calcium they need, they're not looking for extra calcium. I usually dry the shells and I crush them, but sometimes, yeah, I'll just make the omelet and throw the two halves into my chickens. I ch feed my chickens eggs. I feed them scrambled eggs. When we have so many eggs, we don't know what to do with. I feed them raw eggs. If I break an egg in my pocket when I'm collecting, I feed it to them. Yeah. I think chickens that are that are healthy have plenty of room, a good diet, not going to go. Um, but if you if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can certainly use the commercial eggshell. It's it's the same thing. 
Yeah. And I too, I read a lot up on Homestead has some great first time chicken owner books. Lisa has all of the books. You can get them on her website and see all of her collection. Um, uh, I read that if you feed them eggs, anything like eggs, and if an egg breaks, get it out of the coop right away. Cause they'll, they'll peck their eggs and crack their eggs. I've had, you know, a couple random broken eggs, but that's never happened to me either. So you just kind of have to test it out and see what works for you. Kind of in that same vein, Linda's asking about table scraps. So what do you, I don't feed my chickens onions. I don't know why I got this big, you know, things not to feed your chickens. Um, mm -hmm. And that really the only thing I don't feed them is onions. I don't know about you. If you have some tips for Linda on what to feed, I, my chickens love spaghetti. I think they think it's worms. They go crazy for spaghetti. Um, but what about, what about you? Mind you too. That's another topic that there's so much discussion on, on social media. There are some people that just take a hard line and say chickens should never have treats ever because the chicken feed is scientifically balanced. And if you mess up that balance, they're going to not lay eggs. First off, they're pets. Like you said, the eggs are almost a bonus. Also, the second they step out of their coop and they're out in the yard and they've eaten 10 earthworms and, you know, a grub and a handful of dandelion greens, they've thrown that balance off anyway. So we feed them basically all of our kitchen and garden scraps. I don't feed onions. I do on my website have a list of toxic treats, which probably won't kill them, but probably aren't good for them. Avocados are toxic to most birds. I don't oh. know that anyone would buy avocados for their birds anyway, but if you happen to say have an avocado tree or something, um, avocados can be a problem. And then now the nightshade the, family. The fruit or just, I've read about the pit. The, the pit, the skin, okay. I, I stay away from all of it. Interesting. Um, okay. For the compost. Yeah, on the, on the, on the Merck manual, uh, the vet manual, they list the avocado as being a problem. Interesting. So I, I do avoid that. Um, onions can cause anemia. Citrus, too much citrus can cause thin shelled eggs. It leaches the calcium out. But again, you know, this is in moderation. I don't think there's really anything that's going to kill them. And they generally know what they should eat, what they shouldn't eat. Mine don't really eat uh, white potatoes, the other nightshades, the uh, unripe tomatoes can be a problem. You know, there's toxins in them. But if you have healthy chickens, full grown, if they eat a tomato or a tomato plant, it's probably not going to kill them. If you have a chicken who's sick anyway or not doing well or older, might be a problem. Mm -hmm. So I don't go out of my way to give them those things. Right. But I also, you know, wouldn't pick the onions out of a salad if I happen to be throwing them leftover salad. Right. Great. Good and tip. I try to limit treats to 10%. Even the feed companies agree that 10% of their diet can be healthy treats. So they're not talking, you know, like stale Oreos and corn chips or whatever, but, you know, whole grains, meat. Yeah. Chickens are omnivores. They do eat meat. They eat fish scraps. We give them our lobster shells, shrimp shells. So there's really no food group that they can't eat other than dairy. Too much dairy can be a problem. They can't digest it. Um, but again, in moderation, and yeah. most chickens are not, you know, living out 10 or 12 years. So I think people, I think people freak out a little bit too much about things that don't really matter in the long run. Yeah. Speaking of, I could probably look over there and see my neighborhood fox who likes to wait at the back of my fence. Um, let's talk about predators. So I have two dogs, which which somewhat helps, but not entirely. Mm -hmm. So especially with fox, they're so um, domesticated is not the right word, but they're, they're not afraid of dogs as much anymore or people. And predators that we could have to have a whole subject on predators but let's talk a little bit about coop proofing um and then if you have any tips on you know fox what some of our most common predators are and how we could keep our chickens living a few years <laughs> maybe even to 10 maybe even to 10 well first it comes down to if you free range you will have losses it's just a matter of time because there are predators everywhere no matter where you live there's eagles owls uh, hawks Fox, like you said, carries raccoons, skunks, your neighbor's dog, yeah. your dog, weasels, fish or cats, bobcats, you know, depending on where you live, bears. Yeah. I mean, everything basically wants to eat chickens. Um, so if you do free range, it's a calculated risk. If you limit the free range time, if you vary it a little bit, you don't want to get into routines because you know that predators are watching. They're learning your routines. I've even read that if you just move things around, you know, move a couple chairs, put a wheelbarrow out things like that because the predator comes around and things are different. So now they almost reset their clock and they Ooh. have to kind of start assessing again. 
people who have trail cams by their coop have caught a raccoon coming up to the coop door and trying it every single night and then moving on. So all you have to do is leave it unlocked one night. So your, your coop has to have predator proof latches on it. Which means top either a padlock, and bottom. Lisa taught top, me top and bottom. Top and bottom, and if you have a coop where the the nesting box lid lifts up, so many people have said raccoons have gotten in that way because someone goes to check for eggs and doesn't wow. latch it. I personally don't like that design because I think it does leave too much room for someone forgetting to lock it. I prefer to go inside to to get the eggs, um, but I, I use a latch for the carabiner. You want something? Raccoons have thumbs. So if your four-year-old can open the coop, a raccoon can probably open it too. Especially after trying and trying and trying. Um, at our old house, we had dug down deep to, to put our chicken wire in the ground. We did not do that here. Knock on wood, still no issues, but that, you know, you can have a digging animal. I've had another animal pull the chicken wire. So if you're not getting the right gauge chicken wire, they've pulled the chicken wire open and gotten through. Um, maybe it's that thumbed raccoon. I don't know what it was, the nose of a fox. They will they will want to get in. And, uh, you know, part of me, I don't, it's, it's the natural cycle of life. We have this buffet that we're tempting them with. So, you know, you want to protect your chickens the best that you can. Um, but also don't beat yourself up if it happens to you because it's happened to all of us, right? Yeah, yeah. That stuff happens. We had a really bad attack way early on. Two foxes got into our run. We weren't even free ranging, um, but they killed all but three of our chickens and it was horrific. And after that, I spent months just shoring everything up. And like you said, we dug the fence and they had actually dug under our barn to get into the run. So, you know, you, you think you're doing everything right and you realize you're not. I hadn't, you know, I had read books, but I hadn't really paid much attention to, we had horses, we had dogs, you know, it was during the day. I thought I was doing everything right, um, but you can't be too cautious. I had now I have solar predator lights around my coop and my run. Mm -hmm. The fencing mm -hmm. is dug in, it's half inch welded wire. Um, you know, everything I can think of, we actually have an owl, sort of a fake owl perched on the yep. top there. You cannot have too many layers of security. No, you can't. basically what it comes down to. Yeah, especially with all of us home, you know, I like to have my chickens be out during the day. I put them in actually right before this. Um, and it's so much fun. I walk out to my coop. They all run up to you. They all run up to you, whether you're outside or they're in the coop. They, they crowd that corner because they know you're bringing them something lovely or you're going to let them out free range. Um, they're so smart. I, I don't know, actually, if they're smart. I think they're smart, but bird brain comes to mind as that comes out of my mouth. How smart are they? You know, I think considering that they are basically at the bottom of the pecking order, I think they have to be somewhat smart to have survived all these years. They they actually, their senses are pretty good. They don't taste very well or smell very well because that's not how they find their food. But their eyesight is actually better than humans. Their hearing wow. is better than humans. So I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know that, I don't know if they're going to win on Jeopardy, but I don't think that they're... <laughs> You know. Right. What are we measuring smart by? You're right. They have learned, you know, I had a hawk just the other day fly over um, right before our Monday chat that we did last week here on Homestead. Uh, I heard that the, the chickens will alert you. Now, I don't have a rooster, but they were off squawking and they were alerting mm -hmm. me that I saw a hawk swoop down. So I was able to run out because um, I was just in the kitchen with the door open. So they will alert no, they you. They, they alert each other. They don't want to be killed. They're fascinating. No, and especially when you watch a mother hen with baby chicks, if you have the opportunity, it's amazing because I've done it a couple of times. And the last time we did it, she was outside with them. She was actually faking a hawk call to teach her babies that they were supposed to run under the leaves and hide, which I, I, it was fascinating. It's like when she would take them outside, it would either be food foraging, you know, and she would drop things in front of them to show them that it was good to eat and then if one went for something that wasn't good to eat she'd just pop them on the head but this time she was doing the this is the alarm call and you need to hide under the leaves it, it, wow. it's like a drill sergeant with her her little platoon it, you know there and she obviously had no one to teach that to her she probably yeah. hatched in a had a hatchery you know out mm -hmm. of an egg in an incubator so somehow that's all in their dna all the stuff mm. that they learn 
Mm. Well, that's what Heidi's just saying. They're intuitive. Maybe smart's not the right word, but intuitive is a perfect word. Well, we this was so much fun. And thanks for the chance to have my girls shine a little bit here in the background. <laughs> um, I wanted to wrap up and have you talk a little bit about your next venture, which is very exciting. Maybe not such a uh, normal path to go from writing about chickens, but maybe it is because with all those eggs, what else are you going to do but cook? So will you tell us about a little sneak peek into your latest venture? Yeah, I'm excited. Actually, just before COVID hit, I had decided that I had written everything I could write about chickens. I have six books and I decided I wanted to write a cookbook, specifically an egg cookbook. So this last year, it kind of kept me sane working on it, you know, recipe testing and choosing the recipes. And I'm really excited about it. It's coming out next February from HarperCollins. We're going to do the photography for it next month. But I do hope that all these people that now have chickens and have all these eggs and don't know what to do with them will enjoy it because it's got tons of fun recipes and delicious egg recipes in it. Oh, whatever you made the other day, it was round and then it had a little lid and like it had cream inside. Oh, the, yeah, the similar, the, the Lenten buns. The yeah, I knew I couldn't bun. pronounce sem similar, but it looked amazing. If you're following Lisa, you'll still get all of the good juicy chicken tidbits and chicken butt pictures and all of that stuff. But <laughs> now you're getting a ton of recipes and sneak peeks into her cookbook recipes as well. So check her out. Um, we got one last question from Rebecca. Lisa, do you have a favorite breed? I don't know if you're supposed to actually talk about that, you know, like having a favorite <laughs> child, but yeah, the Australorp, I think if I, if I could only raise one breed, I think I would pick the Australorp They're You know, you have them, they're beautiful. They're really gentle and calm. They're great moms. They're really good layers. They're cold hardy. Um, they're just a good all around chicken. I found. Yeah. Well, there you go. You got her to say it, even though you're right. We should not pick a favorite breed. Um, awesome. Well, so thank you so much. Uh, we do have an event at Homestead coming up called Chicks on the Loose. I believe it's still happening on April 3rd, even though chickens are not yet in. But it, like Lisa, Lisa said, chicks you know, were so popular last year. If you want to get them, make sure that you, you watch back, check the list of all the things that Lisa recommended. Some little tips about where to place your coop. Homestead has those big tubs. I never had one of those. I always did a cardboard box bottoms all soggy so i love that tip it's like a, you know you're going from beginner to pro immediately just by getting that big tub and you can reuse it so exactly. um great great tip and let's see if we have any other tips things about chicks on the loose on april 3rd 10 a.m is the virtual vendor booth and 11 a.m is purina presentation by barb goss the importance of early nutrition for chicks but you got all that from lisa today um so please do visit Homestead's website to check back when those chicks will be here and follow Lisa at Fresh Eggs Daily on all social media channels. Thank you so much, Lisa. This was wonderful. Thanks, Katie. And thank you, Homestead. This was made possible by our Garden Rewards member. Please become a Garden Rewards member. Bye-bye. See if I can pull up our last little chick picture before we go. Oh, here's Lisa's cover. We'll hide you, Lisa. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, ready for some chicken pics? Oh, please, so cute. Chicks, ready to be, go to your home. Oh, this is from Lisa's website. Look at those two little chicks eating side by side. So, so cute. All right, and then we'll throw this up and we'll say thank you so much.